what do you think the ethics are of telling someone whose house it is that you saw a ghost? Because maybe you shouldn't tell them. I haven't felt one either. Also, again, this is not for this podcast, right? But uh, um, if ghosts were real, I think slaves would be madder ghosts. Um, you know, ghosts wouldn't always be like little white girls um, in dresses, like, ooh. Or surgeons. <laughs> surgeons. <laughs> That's a very good point. Yeah. Um, but let's get started. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think again, people don't know who we are. Some people can see us, some people can't. Um, but I'm Jeremy O'Harris. Um, and I'm so excited to be chatting with all of you guys because we just finished spending a month together. Um, at this lovely, weird residency that I've decided to call Substratum. Um, okay, so, um, okay, I, I, before I get into what Substratum is or w- why I named it that, uh, can you guys all introduce yourselves? And maybe we should do it like we did it around the table whenever any mentor came. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'll start by saying, by calling out your work, um, the work that got you here, and then um, you telling us a little bit about it. Um, So, uh, you know, I became the president of the Yale Drama Series Prize, as you guys all know. And um, the uh, first thing I got to do while I was there was uh, read 1,700 plays and choose my favorites. And four of those favorites um, became four of the first Substratum Residency Fellows. And um, one of the first plays I put in my top top four was a play called Class. Um, Class was this really beautiful, lovely play that felt really exciting because weirder things were happening outside, uh, out like just off stage than right on it. Um, and the things that were happening right on it were so honest um, and like explosive, and they're like minute details of intimacy and um, complexity. Uh, so the first one I wrote that was Chloe. Hello. And um, tell us a little bit about yourself, Chloe. I'm. Um- Called Chloe Myerson. I'm a TV and theatre writer from London, and I yeah mostly write TV. But last year I had a, a break from TV because a, a project fell through, which is very normal in TV, and very frustrating. And I was feeling kind of dejected. And then I thought, wait a minute, I'm a writer. I can I don't need anyone's permission. I should write something. So I started working on a play. And yeah, there's no, at least in in the UK, there's no money in theatre. So I tried to write something that was small and easy to produce, but that would be, have a large scale and be sort of about uh, political corruption and inequity and everything that I was sort of feeling and was interested in. So it's a play called Class and it's about a young tutor who goes into a rich family and um, kind of gets pulled into a couple of love triangles, and there's sort of some strange things happening on and off stage. It's sort of a love story. It's also sort of a ghost story. And I sent it off to the Yale Drama Series because it was free to enter, and oh, I, I sort of forgot about it. And then suddenly I got this email inviting me here, and it's been amazing. This is very cool. I mean, like, it's also really cool that you are someone who is doing a story that also is, like, so close to things that you actually do because you are an actual tutor. Yeah, I work as a tutor. That's how I pay the bills, uh, as many writers do, as many writers here have have second jobs. So it's, it's, it's about my experiences and it's sort of, yeah, about lots of things. Um, I love it. You know, thinking about people... Um, going wild um, in the sp- in a space of learning. I was thinking about one of the plays that uh, exhilarated me the most when I read it. Um, one of the other, like, quickest entries to my little pile of faves. And that was a play by our youngest writer, Rihanna, called White Girls Gang. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about White Girls Gang and why you wrote it? Yeah. Um, so, hi, I'm Rihanna. Um, I'm from Bermuda, but I live in London. Um, yeah, I wrote White Girls Gang, like, I started writing it, um, just at the end of my first year at university. It's about a group of white women who are trying to kind of understand Audre Lorde's The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House, um, and they don't understand it, (laughs) and they kind of, um, end up unearthing all these past transgressions, um, from their youth where they've done really horrible things, um, they kind of use that information to destroy each other and then themselves, Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote it because I felt like I was going crazy. 
um, right around the time that George Floyd got murdered. Um, Because I had a lot of white people in my life kind of seemingly realize that like race is a construct for the first time. And that was like funny, but also really alarming. So I wrote this play where these women are kind of also realizing that for the first time. Um, And then it kind of destroys them in a way. Um, Yeah. Oh my God. So much fun. And like, it's it's so wild because when I read this play, I was like someone my age, someone of my expressivity had to have written this. And then this very kind, quiet, like uh, one half of a whole, right? Because you're a twin, yeah. you know, like, which is like a good thing, you know, like, like not that you were not with your own person. The last month I've realized that like the Sagittarius in you is loud. And it's real. <laughs> and like you you showed up shy and um and I think that was a mask because like I fully have seen over as each of the nights have passed, the same woman that I thought I was meeting behind the pages of White Girls Gang, um, sitting across the table with me with each passing night. Have you felt something shift within you here? Or did it was it just that you had to take um learn to trust us over four weeks? I think it was learning to trust you, but then also it was like kind of realizing that, like, oh, like, I'm here for a reason. Like, the plays are all picked anonymously. Like, I'm in really good company with people who are very lovely and very nice and kind. Um, so it's been, like, kind of realizing that, like, oh, well, like, this play isn't as bad as I think it is. Like, and kind of, like, going through that. Yeah. What was that imposter... Like, when was the moment where you felt that imp- imposter syndrome start to wane or, like, move away? I think... I don't even know. I think relatively recently. I think... Maybe like two last week, two weeks ago. Because like for the first week, I was like, this is crazy. I shouldn't be here. And I was like really kind of like anxious. I was just like in my room being like, what am I going to do? Da, 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 da. Um, and I think as we've all like gotten to know each other and like everyone's just so nice. Like that's the main thing. Like if everyone was really horrible, I'd be like, I can't do this. Mm-hmm. But um, no, I think it's just been like trusting myself and like trusting that like we all got like picked, I guess, for a reason. And that like it was all kind of like meant to be in a way just like trusting that process. I love it. You know, um, thinking about trusting the process and um, having sort of like skepticism about the process that you're entering into, um, a play that really, really um, sort of minds that and dissects that in a lot of different ways is um, a play by someone I'm sharing the couch with right now. Um, Hello. Hello. This is Asa. And um, Asa wrote a lovely play with a title too long for me to say. Um, It's been a month of me having to say this title to people. It's also been um, almost four months since I've read the play. And yet I still can't uh, say the title because it is that unwieldy. Um, So Asa, will you tell everyone the name of the play, the title of the play you wrote? Yeah, um, I'll do it in one breath if I can. (laughs) (laughs) Um, my name is Asa Haynes, uh, and the play that I wrote is Racism, an unfocused theatre essay of some sort, with a scene at the end that ends in chaos, fire, destruction, and brimstone, and possibly a walkout, or a random title assigned by a producer to attract more white people to theatre by David Mamet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it is a basically a three-act structure title. Uh, um, but the play is about a writer who is doing a workshop rehearsal production um, of racism, the full title, um, in a prestigious London theatre and kind of talks about the discussions of what is the need of black writers having to write about race and racism for predominantly white audiences and white theatres and whether that is for the artistic director, the theatre itself or for the writer or for the writer's peers and kind of like really delves and dissects um, that sort of that sort of world that they have to inhabit and compromises that they're going to have to make within the theatre world and even compromises that they have to make with with themselves and also with their their relationships. Um, It is long, but (laughs) I think that is because I've tried to put out all of my my rage and my anger about having to constantly talk to people, peers, colleagues, students about racism and basically saying the same stuff over and over again. So it is like this, unlike Chloe's, which is very, very small and contained, mine is a kaleidoscopic mess of everything Mm -hmm. that I hate about um, talking about racism, but then also everything that I find extremely funny about talking about racism, because it sometimes is quite funny to just watch people kind of go, wait a minute, 
I do that. My family do that. Mm-hmm. And I just find, quite, find, find that quite funny to put on the page. Um, but yeah, that is my three-act structure play. <laughs> it felt like when I was watch- when I was reading the play, it felt like that was your impulse, was to put like everything you had ever felt onto a stage. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was really excited because I'm like, I've been yearning for humanity and what we write and what we make. And um, yours had that. And it made me think of uh, Melvin Van Peebles' a musical, Ain't Supposed to Die a Natural Death, which is one of my favorite musicals from the 1970s, nominated for Best... Uh, musical Tony, for the best musical Tony over Jesus Christ Superstar, which I think is really interesting. Um, but he wanted to put everything about Black life in America on one stage. Um, so, like, in one scene, there's, like, a, just a big, like, rat from the projects that walks onto the stage and, like, a pimp and, like, all, the, like, all these... But, like, there's, like, 400 people on the stage, or f- seemingly at one point. Um, and your play reminded me of that. That sounds like heaven to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what else were you pulling from when you started writing this play? Um, I think I was pulling from just like perceived personal experiences, like like training as an actor, I always always believe in like the big what if and like what if this could happen, what if that could happen. And then some conversations that I've had with some director friends in the UK about what their experiences were like being a black direct black director or a queer black director in the UK and just kind of piling that all in that I kind of like was like, this is horrible, this is disgusting. And then just basically like Regina George ran into my room screaming and crying and wrote into my burn book. (laughs) Um, And then it kind of like birthed this play. But that's kind of like, I think that's where the inception has come from, from this play. And then over the years, just cultivating it and thinking about what the hell I'm going to write with it, with especially with the end of it. But yeah. You made me think of the other play. Um, you see, it's really good. You guys keep giving me great anchors to move to the next piece. Um, because there's something about um, the usefulness of this fourth play that um, that really sparked uh, my interest because I, I'm really obsessed with great, crisp dialogue and the way people can tell um, uh, tell rich stories by staying true to like the honest idiosyncrasies of how people talk. And I think it's the hardest to do that with young people because a lot of people don't listen to young people. And when I read this play with the title that also used to confound me, but now I've, now I've conquered trunk brief jock thong. Okay. And when I read that play, I was so excited um, because I felt like I was seeing young people and hearing young people that sounded like the young people I see and hear every day in my neighborhood. Uh, and that play was written by DJ. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. Um, my name is DJ Hills. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, theirs. Uh, my play is called Trunk Brief Jock Thong, and it's about a group of uh, queer 18-year-olds who all get together for the first time um, since going off to college. Um, and just uh, the sort of the drama that unfolds as they start to pick at all of the things that um, when they were high school friends, they could ignore. And now that they're growing into adulthood, have kind of risen to the surface. Um, and then uses sort of Brechtian gestures um, to think more broadly about identity and the way that we construct identity and how for queer people, um, identity often isn't something that they're given the opportunity to construct themselves, but it's something that society um, gives them that they have to sort of mold themselves into. Love it. Thanks. So, when you, <laughs> great. Um, you know, being out here, you know, I've seen that you've also been like running through lots of different, other, lots of other stories because you are, you are currently in grad school um, and you're actively about to do your thesis, correct? Yeah, yeah. So I'm finishing up my MFA um, at UCLA um, in playwriting. And so I'm starting the process of, um, yeah, my thesis. So I, the way that the process works, I'm meeting with my dramaturg now to do a final pass on the script. In the fall, I'll meet with the designers, and then the show will go up in the winter. Wow. Yeah. And and you, I feel like you, are you and Asa, and maybe my, the next person I'm going to introduce, have probably written the most since you've been here, it feels like, or it sounds like. It feels like you, <laughs> the three of you are constantly like, I wrote this last night, I wrote this last night. Um, can you tell me about the play you wrote the other day that has such a delicious title? Yeah, it's called Horse Girl and Cow Daddy. Um, it's about a uh, trans woman in her 30s, her and her, her father, um, 
live in a small sort of forgotten railroad town in southern Pennsylvania. And um, this uh, non-binary um, sort of Teach for America person comes in and starts a relationship with Horse Girl um, and is uh, covers the the uh, the play covers their romance um, over the the corn harvest season um, and it's looking at sort of the interrogating the myth of urban exceptionalism um, in rural spaces and this idea that rural people need sort of urban ideologies in order to to thrive. It's hot. I love that. <laughs> um, it sounds really fun to imagine how you know this new relationship is formed. And how Cow Daddy is going to respond to it. Yeah, Because um, I feel like Cow Daddy's not going to like that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get this girl. Um, you know, thinking about intimacies and relationships and urban exceptionalism, um, it has me thinking about uh, another piece that I really love called uh, Sex Act. And Sex Act was not a play. Sex Act was a screenplay, a screenplay written by someone that was very surprising to me. And when it came across my desk, I said to myself, Oh, this person needs to needs to come out to my substratum thing. We need to have a space for people who are writing in film and television because I also write in film and television, and I want to see them focus on this piece and make it bigger and better because it's so aligned with so many things I'm really into. And that was a play called that was a screenplay called Sex Act by Rafi Donatik. Hello, thank you. My name's Rafi Donatich. Um, I, yeah, I wrote this series, television series called Sex Act, and it's about an intimacy coordinator who herself has never been kissed. Um, and for those of you who don't know, an intimacy coordinator works on plays and film and television sets to choreograph all of the intimate scenes, much like you um, might choreograph a fight scene. So uh, she works on this play starring, you know, the most famous Hollywood couple you could imagine. And they have stopped being able to be intimate with each other. And so they pro project a lot onto this woman. And I just, I, I was really interested in thinking about what it would mean for a person to be an expert at something precisely because they have no experience with it. Um, because what even is experience? You know, it's such a weird word when used in that context. And yeah, it's about fantasy. It's about the psychosexual and how that kind of hovers above, you know, most if not all interactions in this life for some of us. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's that. Wait, and what's one of the fantasies this person engaged in? Oh, man. I mean, I we were talking the other day, like, these fantasies could even take place on a stage itself, which would be a really cool, like, cinematic gesture. But I'm imagining her, you know, doing a strip tease for an old person's home or, like, slipping into the tiger's cage at the Bronx Zoo um, in front of a crowd, you know, or being escorted into Target and being told she can buy anything she wants, which is my <laughs> personal fantasy. <laughs> substratum was something I Googled today. I was like, why did I call it substratum? Like, I've totally forgotten. And I remember that my, the definition of substratum is the foundation or basis of something. And the foundation and basis of my craft and what I do actually came when I was at a place kind of like Monteverde, the beautiful green villa we're in right now. Um, it wasn't as green. It wasn't as um, Tuscan. Um, but it was a place where I got to sit and have dinner every night with other artists, other writers. And I got to focus on just writing for a month. Um, because I think that's the basis of how you make good work. Um, so can you guys tell me some of your, like, favorite, you know, just, like, popcorn ideas of some of your favorite moments of sitting around the table, talking to other writers, meeting new mentors? What's, what's this last month been like? I uh, remember just hearing about your editor, Pete Oz, and mm. a great filmmaker, about his process. And we had just watched his movie, Jethica, <laughs> um, the night before. And we were all blown away and had no idea how he made this thing. And then just getting to hear that, his process comes from just the desire to have fun and collaborate with a group of people and um, spend time meaningfully instead of these weird ways we think something has to be made. Um, that was really inspiring, and I want to steal his process. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he does make all his movies for seven thousand to ten thousand dollars, which is iconic. And I did I thought it was very important to have someone like Pete here early because Pete is someone who. 
I think can be a great model for an artist at the start of their career to know that you can actually have a very long career without constantly needing to chase like, you know, a big studio saying yes to you, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that was really inspiring for me. I feel like there's this thing that happens where if you have a little bit of success, the industry sort of tells you, okay, now get in line and wait for somebody to give you permission to to make something bigger, to 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 make what you want to make. And meeting Pete and just realizing, no, I don't have to wait. And it's sort of weird and ironic to like wait because you've had success. Like maybe you had a small play that was a hit or a reading. And then it's like, okay, now I have to be in this bigger theater. So I'll just like wait for the literary department to read my play. It's like, you don't have to do that, you know? And that was really great. Yeah, I was talking to her about this last night, but um, one of my favorite uh, memories of being here is is, um, spending time with Jazz, um, Jasmine Lee Jones. Yeah, um, and we were uh, sitting out in the lounge, like nibbling on some some chocolate and just talking about um, uh, like trusting your your instinct and your gut. And I was telling her about this experience that I had, where I had like a feeling about um, a project, but I was, you know, people were telling me they're like, you know, just like go for it, work with this person. And I was like, I don't know, um, and we did and. Um, the project turned out to be okay, but it wasn't it wasn't the the best collaborative experience I've ever had. And Jasmine was asking me, she was like, um, but what is like what is it that that made you say no? And I was we were talking about like the way that I think um that your gut is almost always right, but that we often just like have convinced ourselves to like push that down because we can't we can't pinpoint why it is we feel bad about something. So we're like, okay, if I don't know the exact reason as to why, then I'm just going to like ignore it. Um, But that you don't always have to know the why. You just have to know that like, I have a, I have a feeling. Um, That was a really special kind of conversation. There's constantly someone inside of you being like, you're a dummy, you're a dummy. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. And then there's this really warm, cool thing inside of you being like, no, I think you do. Like, (laughs) and I don't know why you're a dummy. It's the louder voice all the time. Um, I think one of the things that's been cool about being here is that I, you know, I still have that you're a dummy, you're a dummy. Like, I mean, again, now I'm now I feel like I'm channeling jazz because I was about to quote Precious. It like there that voice has been so loud, but I do feel like there's something that that quiets that voice by being able to take like a mile long walk through like the like I don't I, they're not moors that's in Scotland, but right. like the what the yeah. the valley out here, like the the seeing that much green and wandering through it makes you listen to that gut inside. Yeah. Sure. There, was, there was one day a couple of weeks ago, I was like, do you know what? I'm going to take a long walk. So there's this, uh, I don't know, like caves, like burrows called uh, La Faguita, which has been very it, wonderful for all of us to find and say. Um, but I took a really long walk, listened to the entirety of, did you know there was a tunnel under Ocean Boulevard by Lionel Di Ray, which has been probably the substratum uh anthem yes. and like soundtrack for the past four weeks um but i really is like just walking through just looking at nature and seeing how green things are because i don't know like green looks different here in like a really different way and obviously we're in a green room and me talking about green but um that that whole like hour and a half two hours of me just like walking around getting lost being a bit scared and realizing that there is maybe something behind me uh, but that's no that's just <laughs> some tourists um, but yeah, there's just something really nice about just actually clearing your mind out instead of just like going insane, looking at a notebook, trying to figure out what vowel to put next to which noun and like trying to figure out what this story is actually trying to say. And yeah, I've, I think I've really learned that even if you do have those voices in your head, that's screaming, telling you that you're a dummy, you're a dummy, you're a dummy, whatever, that you kind of, you are doing exactly the right thing this is actually really helpful for us to feel like we have earned, we've, ha- we've earned respite, we've earned rest and relaxation instead of like doing on, doing on our backs, typing at a laptop or a notebook. Um, but it's, yeah, there's a, this whole experience has been really, really cathartic and uh, quite emotional in not, not just like a cry sort of way, but also in a really laughy sort of way. Because I think we spent maybe about a week and a half just laughing. Oh, yeah, that uh, first the, week. Yeah, that we first week. We were just, like, <laughs> I, like, just cackling. Because, like, this is, like, the, the idea of being here was just, like, insane. But, like, I think being here, like, and kind of realizing that, like, we're all meant to be here is, like, very validating in a way. Like, I, like, 
as a writer, you're just like alone most of the time writing. And that can be like really isolating. And like being here with other writers makes you feel like, oh, I, like I'm with people who get what like it's like because it's so rigorous and like exhausting sometimes. And then you kind of just get to talk about writing and like go for these walks. And it feels very like affirming in a way. Like I feel very affirmed having been here. And I feel like freer in my work, like less like tense and tied up and like trying to make things um, not like understandable, but kind of like real. And I can just kind of like splash around and be like, oh, this is what I'm writing. It can be bad for a bit and that's fine. I can come back to it fresh. Like that's been really nice. Yeah. I love it. I'm also, I mean, I like that we we want to make it laughy, um, but there are cameras here. There is a microphone. If you want to make it cry, I will not deny you the chance. Like, I want to be Oprah. So um, <laughs> last night, there were a lot of tears at dinner, a lot of tears at dinner. So we can, is it too, is it too bright for tears? Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, if, no, it's not too bright. No, I'm it's joking. never too bright for tears. It's the last day. If you start crying now, we'll Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. I think, like, if if we were to get, like, really... <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, don't do it. No, I'm joking. No, no, no. No. Go there. No. <laughs> drive it, drive it. No, but I think, just like off of what Rihanna was saying, I, I because... None of us knew who the hell we were going to meet when we were landing in Rome. Um, and do you know, actually, the funniest thing, I, this is hilarious to me, like, looking back, me, Chloe, and Rihanna are all on the same flight. We're in, like, a seat with each, yeah, each other. Yeah, across the aisle, and then Rihanna yeah, was behind I, you. Yeah. I think just before taking off, I looked over and I was like, who the hell is reading Slave Play? What? Who's reading Slave Play? This is a weird coincidence. And I sat there for, like, an hour on the flight just going, this person's not going to Substratum. They, got, they can't be going to Substratum. I kept trying to flash the book at I know, you. Like, and then I, did, I, I had suspected. And then I did the shady thing. I was like, do you know what? I'm going to read Fairview. <laughs> <laughs> For the, like, the last five minutes of the I was flight. trying to see what you were reading. And I know. Get... And, then <laughs> we, and then we all got up and we're just like, we do like yeah. the Spider-Man meme. It's like substratum. I, I asked you if you were going to play residency, and you were like, "Yes, I am." As if I'd asked you, "Are you in line for the bank?" I was like, "This person is really chill." Like, but I, but it felt good. It felt yeah. like such a relief because you, you two were so clearly like nice people. And yeah, Jeremy talked about how amazing it is that you you pick these plays anonymously, and you feel like you've connected with all of us. But you also picked a group of people like we all really get on with each other. We all like just immediately. There was no awkwardness so so weirdness like it's felt like a home here um for the last month and um part of that was because each of you added something new whether it was like a new a new tier at the table that like you know uh sparked both like a sense of like um gratitude or a sense of like um camaraderie or if it was like the ringing out of someone's laughter down the hall that like like brought some nostalgic memory of childhood or drama school or whatever. It constantly, I was surprised by how um, how easy it was to make a family with the five of you, um, and and how easy it was to do that with all of the people that came through. Um, you know, we had Rebecca Hall and Morgan Spector, and we had uh, um, Jordan Tannehill. Uh, who else have we had? Una. We had Buna Makuda, uh, Jim Wilson, yeah, Sarah Bosch Jacobson, Jim Wilson, Ariel Reynolds. Being around all, so much history and knowing that, like, every time you look outside, you're seeing the background to a different Renaissance painting. Yeah. It's been making me think a lot about the Renaissance and about, like, you know, how Italy had such a great, uh, um, a great run of it, you know, like, of, like, producing phenomenal artists. And a lot of that came from a uh, the idea or the sort of um, necessity of patronage, right? Um, and one of the things that's really cool about Substratum and really cool about Gucci is that Gucci allowed, like, Gucci became my patron to allow me to extend their patronage to others, right? Um, and I've just been thinking a lot about, like, you know, how in a time when, you know, in, our, in the U.S., at least, President Biden is just now reforming the the Arts Council. Like, literally yesterday it was announced that he, like, just reformed. It was, like, Lady Gaga on the board. Um, and, like, you know, they're finally starting to put funding back into the National Endowment of the Arts. But when also m multiple theaters around the country are closing, in the U.K., like, Arts Councils are pulling funding left and right. Um, and that sort of sense that... Um, 
there is no real safety net or um, or sort of support for young art means that the art that does get made tends to be safer, tends to be fearful. Um, it's made me it's made me so grateful that um, when I sat down and talked to everyone at Gucci, they were like, "Oh, this plan makes sense." Like obviously, after two years of being like shuttered, you know, the theaters being shuttered. Artists would not know what to do. Young artists would not know what to do. Like other artists might not know what to do and might not have space to do it. Um, you know, what has the last couple of years been like for you guys? And what has this time been like um, in comparison? Yeah, it's so true what you say. And it, what coming here has made me realize is all the slashes to the Arts Council funding in the UK, they haven't just taken away opportunities. They've taken away a sense of community. It's very isolating being a writer in London. There isn't a space to communicate with other artists because those kinds of programs are the first things to go. And so, yeah, just having space and time to talk with other artists and to create a community is something I didn't even realize I was missing. You know, one of the things that's also quite funny is that um, another reason I wanted to do this, both in Italy and with Gucci, is that the first time I felt really, really inspired, like, in a, in a way, through clothes <laughs> like you know because I'm, I'm always inspired by clothes i love i love dressing myself i feel like every time i put on an outfit i'm telling a new story about myself um but when i went to um the the uh gucci show in milan that and and, and saw like i saw something happen on the runway and i can't even fully um articulate um the nuances of what the that moment of seeing this dress move in this way but i saw a dress moving away and after the show i ran up to the team and i was like have you seen castellucci that moment felt like castellucci who's like my favorite italian theater director um and so when we when we knew that we were going to be here and um we had this opportunity to be as close as we were to florence i'm so excited we got to go to the gucci archive because i feel like there I don't, I don't know. I, there were so many things that I, I keep thinking about. Like, you know, even just like the utility of the latches in the 1930s or 20s. I can't remember what year it was. When the first suitcases were made. Mm-hmm. I was just like looking at that and I'm thinking about that. And I'm making a TV show about um, someone making furniture right now. And I was just like, oh, I can't wait to like think about the details of um, them making their mark on the world when they were this young, young company. Um, through the latch and the and this very simple emblem that said Gucci. Was there, was there anything there that like really sparked for you guys? I mean, being uh, a flaming homosexual, <laughs> uh, looking at Lana Del Rey's Met Gala uh, outfit for, what was it? Was it? Camp. For camp. It was genuinely one of like the most insane things I've ever seen in my life. Because <laughs> I've like, I've never, I've never seen couture before in my life. I've never seen something that has been so intricately made in my life. Um, so being literally like this close, obviously not touching it because <laughs> security, um, <laughs> but being like this close and just looking at the beading and looking at the patterns and looking like it, even the metal work of like her, her heart that had the, um, that had swords going into it. I just looked at it. I was like, it, it, it's just one of those moments where you go, when something so monumentous and beautiful gets made, there are so many tiny little fine details that kind of put it all together. If that what if this one bead was placed slightly differently, the whole outfit would be completely different. It wouldn't be what I'm looking at right now. So it was just really, really special to just kind of go, it's Lana Del Rey. I'm like, you know, six degrees separation from Lana Del Rey, but also this is a, just like an incredible garment in itself. I'm going to make sure she gets this episode. <laughs> Please do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she's also my, my <laughs> she's been my, um, my uh, wallpaper on my phone from a long time. And then when Jeremy saw it, she's like, he was like, it's my, it's my magazine. I was like, yeah, it's a good photo. That's what I've got on my phone. <laughs> um, but I think that was like one of the moments when we went to the Gucci archive, I was like, Jesus, this is like, yeah just the detail to make something so beautiful and monumentous. It's just, it was quite special. It was really, really special. 
the archive was just because I work in an archive at the National Theater and like I love the National Theater's archive, but like it failed so much in comparison to the Gucci one. <laughs> oh my god, not the National Theater well, getting, no, no, getting right. strange. Like, oh, they're different things. I'm not trying to drag the National. I don't want to lose my job, please. Um, I'm just putting it out there. But um, no, like just the way that like because you can see how every like object it because it wasn't just like clothes. It was like lighters and like like picnic sets and like all this like really intricate stuff like you can tell that like all this like time and effort has been like made into like making everything and now like really it's like there's something to my brain because like the way that I think about writing is like a similar way that I think about like making stuff or like physically making stuff like you're having to like churn it out and it's like a process and it's like doing drafts it's like using your hands like it really kind of put it into my brain that like they're making stuff and like we're making stuff. It's just in a different way. Um, and I really loved being there. It was crazy. Yeah. They're making stuff. We're making stuff. They're making but just stuff, like we're making in a stuff. different way. <laughs> <laughs> that is the that is for me the like the the summation of our day in Florence. You know, going to the Gucci Asteria, you know, being in the store, going to the archive. I think that, like, you know, you know, we all did a bad thing and we read commenters um, who were like, why are they doing a thing with Gucci if they're writers? What does writing have to do with Gucci? And it's like, they're making stuff. We're making stuff. Just in a different way. <laughs> and it's cool, to, it's cool to make stuff with other people who like making stuff. Um, and I'm so grateful that we got to make stuff for this month in this space here. Um, but, I mean, we have a lot... We have a lot of things to do today, guys. You guys have to share some of the stuff you've been making. Um, we're going to chat with Janixa Bravo over Zoom. Um, and we also have to, like, you know, prep and eat before that. So um, is it okay if we wrap this up now? And then, yeah. okay. Let's get some food. Yeah. Let's get some food. Yeah. Um, who are you guys sad that this is? Your, is your last lunch made by Roberto? Let's not talk about that. That's <laughs> off limits. Yeah. <laughs> that will bring the tears. That, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well, I'm going to go. Um, I'm excited for pasta. Me yeah. too. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao.